I'm just looking for a decent pen that writes. Should we start? Uh, we go, Aidya. So uh, we welcome you all to Zadika Mahatsa Lecture Series. And today we have two students, um, Professor Bangi and Sadhguru And um, today's lecture is titled Colonialism, Nationalism, and um, So um, I think both did not actually be useful to have. A Hello, uh, Vijayasri, your voice is breaking. OK. Okay. Um, introduction, well-known historians, but I think to under, have a certain perspective of today's lecture, which is very important, um, and uh, which resonates entirely with the idea of take uh, a you know, about of modern history. More important not a historian, but also intellectual. He's involved in Adivas, Dalit journalists. I think this dynamic is very important, brings in a very different texture to the kind of writings that he has published. Uh, he is a historian of subaltern, so that says it. His work is largely on nomads and Adivasis. He has written three important books. The first one on subjugated nomads, it's about the Lambadas and an Nizam's rule. It gives a fascinating history of two centuries of the uh, Lambadas from the transition from enterprising caravan traders to their sedentarization and later criminalization and the responses to this transformed role in an identity. Um, which is very important, I think. And the second book is far more fascinating. It's on the title, The Roots of the Periphery. It's a history of the Goans from Mughal to the colonial period. And uh, what it does is it provides a historical narrative, the political agency of the Goans, uh, which is brought about by the fascinating idea that he proposes that the roots of the periphery, within quote, periphery implying Adivasis and um, nomads, lie in the center. Uh, that is very telling, moving beyond both frames of isolationism and um, integrationist, assimilationist historiographies, um, which actually erase the dynamic and history of conflicts, struggles, and especially the agency of Adivasis the, and the political choices, the way we interpret the political choices and cultural identity. For Wangya Bukya, they are not passive, but conscious acts of self-rule and self-determinism. Probably far more fascinating um, also is um, his uh, history of modern Telangana, which is very interesting again for me from the perspective of a historian, um, because very few of us would have the rare experience of personally experiencing the great responsibility involved in, and the sense of being implicated in writing on the history of a newborn state, that is Telangana, and conscious and being conscious of how integral cultural identity and historical consciousness are to state building processes. Uh, so it is with this spirit, I'm sure that the note also promises, the note on the lecture promises to discuss issues. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, the note uh, that is of, of lecture promises to discuss issues that constitute the main concerns of the Azadi Mahotsav, which according to the um, um, website declaration says that one of its goal is to recover neglected histories of freedom. Um, Sanjukta Dasgupta is a professor at the University of Rome with varied research interests from agrarian environmental history, social history of the marginalized to that of Adivasis. She has, she has authored Adivasis and the Raj and the transition of the Hose. Uh, it is in a way um, very much related to the kind of work that um, uh, Mangya does about the historical dynamics and ch challenges of the host and the ways in which um, it 
elicited a response, the external and internal logic of transformation in relation to oneself and the outside during pre-colonial and colonial period. Uh, so I'm sure that we're gonna have a lively discussion after a more intense lecture. I invite uh, Professor Sanjukta Dasgupta to chair the session. Here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Vijayashri, and uh, thank you indeed for this uh, generous uh, uh, introduction. And uh, without, uh, so we have this very fascinating uh, discussion before us. And so without kind of wasting any time, let's just go on to it, uh, start with the lecture. And uh, uh, so I call on Pangya with, uh, to start with his lecture. And I think Pangya, you will be uh, talking for about 40 minutes, we decided. And then um, we will go on to the Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Uh, thank you, uh, Sanjita. And uh, at this outset, uh, I uh, thank uh, uh, our friends at uh, uh, CSDS, uh, particularly you know, for Vijay Sri uh, for you know, inviting me to uh, speak uh, from CSDS uh, forum. Uh, I feel you know, a privilege uh, to you know, uh, speak from this forum. So, uh, um, uh, Okay, uh, let me straight away uh, go you know, into you know, my you know, uh, paper. Uh, it is uh, titled as Colonialism, Nationalism, and Adivasi Resistance in India. Uh, uh, we are discussing colonialism and Adivasi nationalism when the government of India is uh, celebrating Ajatika Amrit Mocho to commemorate uh, 75 years of India's uh, freedom from British colonial rule. Uh, universities and uh, government departments are asked to organize uh, seminars, workshops, and uh, uh, rituals uh, for this uh, celebration. Uh, however, the Sedition Act passed by the colonial government in 1870 is still hanging on our heads. Even 84 years old, Stan Swami, an Adivasi activist, was not spared from this NOCA Act. Many activists working for Adivasi rights have been subjected to this uh, draconian colonial act. It is not clear why we should celebrate Ajadika Amrut Mosso uh, when most of the colonial approaches are still in force, rather more aggressively in impl uh, aggressively you know, uh, implemented. The Adivasi insurgencies starting from Paharia Sirdas of Chota Nagpur of 1778 to the most recent Patalgadi of 2017 have received same kind of treatment by the respective governments. The Adivasis of India have been resisting the colonial and post-colonial state for the last 244 years. However, these uh, unending resistances, uh, witness resilience, uh, defeatism, violence, negotiations, betrayal, and uh, many more. The question uh, now is, how do we see uh, uh, the continuum of these resistances? Uh, particularly you know, in the context of uh, Ajadika Amrut Motsu celebration by the Indian government. If the anti-colonial resistances of Adivasis are national, then what are their post-colonial resistances? Are they anti-national or national in their own right? Importantly, can we see the colonial and post-colonial Adivasi resistance in the same lexicon. I will try to address these questions to some extent uh, in this uh, lecture. Let us first uh, turn to uh, unravel uh, how the, the Adivasi uh, resistances have been pursued and imagined in post-colonial literature. As just mentioned, the Adivasis of uh, India waged a number of revolts and resistance against the British colonial rule. But only a few got the attention of our historians, particularly Santal Sahul of 1855, uh, Mundas uh, Uligan of 18, 
1900, Ramaraju's Pituri of 1922-24, and some other movements by Bills, Gones, Coles, Voraus, Nagas, and Khasis have got notice of our Noka historian. Of course, uh, in a derogatory Noka way, the problem with our uh, history writing is uh, it fails to stretch colonial histories to the post-colonial period. The Adivasis of India are subjected to uh, double colonialism, that is British colonialism and uh, Indian settler uh, colonialism. Uh, beside the uh, continuation of the British colonial apparatus, the exploitation by the Indian settler colonists is the most important concern of our time. Multination mining companies are new additions uh, to the loot of the Adivasi areas, which made Adivasi life impossible. Given this reality, we cannot understand the history of Adivasis unless we make a connection between the colonial and the post-colonial histories. Unfortunately, uh, somehow uh, Indian history stops at 1947. More importantly, we fail to recreate our past uh, from the standpoint of post-colonial predicaments of the subaltern communities. The recreation of India's past stuck by the nation-making project in which the Adivasis were seen as just pawns. Adivasi communities were engaged in probably more resistant and insurgencies against the colonial state than any other community of Indian society. This led the colonial and post-colonial state to identify the Adivasis as problematic and violent communities. The insurgent consciousness of the Adivasis, which aimed to turn colonial rural India upside down, also found a biological foundation in colonial ethnology. After the decolonization, serious attempts have been made by nationalists and Marxist scholars to re-examine the colonial version of Indian history as a part of the nation-making project. This indeed, created an opportunity uh, 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 to construct a secular history for India. However, the project of nation making has largely failed to capture the history of uh, all section of a society and produce a, sect a, a, a sectarian or a distorted history for India. The Adivasi anti-colonial autonomous resistances were either excluded entirely in the national history or merged with that of the larger national movement in order to make the Adivasis a part of the nation of a state. Such constructions of the Adivasi movements not only devastated the long established uh, spirit of the Adivasi autonomy, but also subordinated them in the new nation state. These Adivasi resistances were anti-colonial in their own right and deeply rooted in the spirit of a political and cultural autonomy, targeting both colonial state and dominant non-Adivasis. On the other hand, most orthodox Marxist scholars celebrate anti-colonial Adivasi resistance as a stage for the creation of a new class consciousness. Though they designate such mobilization as sporadic, spontaneous, unorganized, and pre-political, they welcome these mobilizations as they provide an opening for the education of the Adivasis in class consciousness by Marxist party workers, allowing the Adivasis areas to become the base, the basis for the radical politics and movements. Marxist scholarship has, however, failed to provide an adequate understanding of Adivasi movements as it fails to distinguish the autonomy of Adivasi insurgencies from a monolithic and hegemonic nationalist movement. Thus, an insurgent identity was attributed to the Adivasi communities that involved subalternity and the primitivism. 
particularly adivasi intellectual history myths rumors stories which is uh, the source of insurgent consciousness has not been seen as a form of resistant and contesting power ranjit guha has uh, thoroughly exposed the elitist approach of nationalist cambridge and marxist scholarship particularly on the present movements of colonial india however guha had failed to see the adivasis as a separate entity from that of the plain peasant uh, peasantry guha's peasant class as an analytical category is equally problematic however the inauguration of the subaltern project marked an epoch in the uh, study of subaltern histories with its uh, sharp departure from a marxist historiography that valorized secular and class based movements over and above religious or caste based movements which were seen to be riddled with the false consciousness subaltern studies see caste community in very different terms as a force for radical anti colonial mobilization and organization that operated according to the own uh, according to its own uh, rationality which was anti capitalist and which had a potential to feed into a future socialist society in a way that uh, bypassed uh, capitalism the post colonial indian government's attempt to celebrate the anti colonial adivasi heroes were purely to inag- uh, integrate the adivasis uh, into uh, <clears throat> and, uh, no, uh, uh, sorry into the no nation state uh such a celebration uh, don't give uh, an ideological integrity to adivasi politics uh, gaidili the mizo women who was imprisoned in 1932 and released after independence is depicted as champion of anti colonial movements in the northeastern regions of india she was honored with a title called rani by jawaharlal nehru when he visited her in jail after the independence she was also awarded a uh, tamra patra by the government of india she was invited to inaugurate uh, many government seminars and uh, development projects in the region she was also projected as a follower of mahatma gandhi the fact was that she had run a militant movement mobilizing about uh, 4000 adivasi armed forces the national state actually used her to impress upon the adivasis of that part of india and take them into confidence in the project of nation making by constructing a said history of anti colonial struggle another much celebrated adivasi hero uh, from the times of a british anti colonial movement is birsa munda who fought ferociously against the british in chota nagpur and ultimately died in colonial in a colonial jail in 1900 at the session of the indian national congress uh, ramgarh in 1940 the <coughs> uh, sorry, uh, the main gate was named after naka birsa munda after the independence uh, he is depicted as a national icon of the adivasis he is the only adivasi leader whose portrait uh, hang, uh, hangs in the central hall of uh, the you know, parliament and award is also instituted in his name uh, for rendering services to adivasis also the ranchi airport and uh, purilia university are named after his name these celebrations and iconism did not uh, expand a number of stigmas attached to adivasis Uh, during the colonial you know, period rather this ended up uh, depicting adivasis as a more primitive or half human in the uh, human evolution rani gaidili and birsa munda are just seen as the leaders of the adivasis and not as the leaders of india although a huge range of non adivasis participated in the movements uh, under their leadership particularly the lower castes had taken a crucial role in their movements non adivasi vaishnavites were important disciples of uh, birsa munda 
the project of uh, integrating the adivasis uh, into the uh, nation building through the construction of uh, histories and iconism has a, a serious implication back on the adivasi you know, society indeed inclusion and exclusion have been going hand in hand the nationalist uh, romanticization of adivasis made their society as remnants of our old civilizations such mere celebration failed to give ideological integrity to adivasi society in fact the nestle scholarship did not make any serious attempt to document history of adivasi mobilization the adivasi resistance uh, resistances find only some passing uh, res sorry, references in the huge volumes uh, produced on the indian national uh, movement notably these volumes have depicted the adivasis just as a follower of the larger national movements headed by the uh, non adivasi leaders or as backward uh, mentalities as if they do not have their own political consciousness such constructions uh, have serious uh, implications on the uh, post colonial uh, politics of the adivasis reading post colonial against the colonial helps us to understand the continuity between the two uh, no, uh, <clears throat> two uh, it is to say we should read more uh, post colonial uh, predicaments against the colonial subjectivity then one would get the continuum of the state brutality against the adivasis strictly speaking there is not much difference between the colonial and post colonial uh, in the case of adivasis rather adivasis were uh, subjected more uh, to exploitation land eviction and state violence uh, in the post colonial period the famous demand you know, for the adivasi <coughs> sorry the, the 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 famous demand of the adivasis jal jamin and jangil are still unfinished agendas the recent study by uh, high power committee headed by professor virginia skaka has ventilated the acute poverty and vulnerability of the adivasis under the post colonial state adivasis uh, denial of forest and land rights continued even in the you know, post colonial india rather a more stringent system was practiced to check adivasi movement in the forest the alienation of adivasis from land is more evident than in the kind of colonial period despite the protective mechanisms a report by girglani on adivasi land alienation in telangana has underlined the uh, underlined that about 70% of land in adivasi area uh, areas is in the hands of non adivasis importantly the protective mechanism always work now in favor of the non adivasis that is how most of the ltr cases have gone in favor of non adivasis above all a large part of indian forests and hill are being parceled to multinational mining companies the kind of destruction done by these companies in the adivasi areas is beyond no, our comprehension the pesa act uh, which was designed to ensure self rule in adivasi villages has just ended up in producing you know mediocrates in the adivasi society this act indeed helped the government to parcel of the adivasi areas to multinational companies added to this the construction of big irrigation dams and you know, power projects have displaced millions of adivasis uh, from their you know, land importantly the adivasi uh, legal uh, protective mechanisms are often uh, overridden by the general laws of the country particularly land acquisition act public interest act and uh, wildlife protection acts the wildlife protection act of uh, 1972 had brought a heavy pressure on the noga adivasis particularly the wildlife uh, protection amendment act of uh, 1982 criminalized the adivasis uh, by 
decreeing them as illegal inhabitants. Under this act, a large number of Adivasis were driven out of the Ganoko forest, evicting them from their land. This further made the Adivasis vulnerable during the acute impoverishment of the Adivasis. Particularly, newspapers highlighted the you know, starving deaths in Adivasi areas. These glaring facts led the Indian government to enact the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers recognition of Forest Rights Act of 2006. However, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, enactment of uh, FRA and its implementation uh, in the last uh, uh, 20 years or so has raised several issues uh, on the question of uh, Adivasi collective rights over forest resources and forest lands. The FRA aimed at ensuring Adivasi collective forest resources rights, uh, habitation rights for most primitive groups and uh, uh, conversion, uh, sorry, conservation of forest uh, villages into revenue villages uh, in their respective areas. However, the act is poorly implemented. In some areas, it is just ignored. The poor implementation of the act is largely because of the indifferent attitude of the state towards the Adivasis. It is evident from the recent studies that the FRA utterly failed because it's uh, uh, offered, I mean, so it offered only restricted use of forest resources. Importantly, the legality of the act is being questioned by the civil society organization and the wildlife protection uh, NGOs. The recent Supreme Court judgment to evict the Adivasis from reserved forests to protect wildlife has asked the Adivasis a hope to realize the demand for forest rights. The first colonial state uh, failed to address the Adivasi question because of its uh, uh, legalistic approach to their cause, which is uh, rooted in the colonial political rationality. Both the state and Adivasis are now caught in this legal frame, which often goes against the later. The Adivasis question is basically political, and it demands a political settlement within the Indian federal system, which would ensure the Adivasis uh, Adivasi autonomy and freedom in the forest. The Adivasis have been resisting the post-colonial state and outsiders from the 1960s across India in different uh, you know, uh, form. Uh, I think it is uh, important uh, you know, here uh, uh, to discuss two major resistance of the post-colonial period uh, namely Indraveli and Patalgadi resistance uh, to understand the Adivasi politics of our time better. These two resistances, uh, which were grounded on the philosophy of Adivasi autonomy, were the most violent responses to the post-colonial August state. Indraveli revolt, uh, which occurred on 20th April 1981 in the Adilabad district of East while Andhra Pradesh was a major Adivasi revolt after the uh, uh, Sri Kakulam revolt of 1969 in the state. Indraveli was a long drawn resistant against the eviction of the Adivasis from their land and forests, but the massacre mainly signifies it. In this incident, according to the government uh, sources, 13 insurgent bones were killed in Indravalli village. On this day, uh, the Girijana Raitapuli Sangha, uh, tribal farmers and uh, laborers union of Adilabad district had planned to organize a public meeting, but police did not permit the meeting. Despite the police ban on the Ganaka meeting and imposition of section 144 in the village, about uh, 5,000 bones turn up for the meeting. This led the police to fire at the Gones crowd discriminately, indiscriminately. 
a large number of goats were killed. The number of death is still being disputed. The state government attributed the incident to provocation by the Kondapalli Sitaramaya Nexlet group. The government also described the incident as a uh, confrontation between Adivasis and non-Adivasis and not as one against the government or state. Fact-finding reports by human rights uh, forums expose the actual facts of the uh, incident. According to this report, police high-handedness towards the Adivasis turned into violence and a massacre. Bones and other Adivasis had uh, uh, headed for Iravilli starting out early in the morning on foot and in vehicles from the uh, from villages of Adilabad and from Chandrapur district. But they were stopped on the outskirt, chased with lattes or batons, beaten up and sent back. Many Gons were not aware of the imposition of section 144 and could not uh, understand why they are not allowed to enter the village. So despite the police barrier, the Gons continued entering the village. Police began by firing tear gas, but soon began firing at the Gons without any warning. Some policemen took up positions on the tops of the trees and fired, uh, while others fired at the crowd indiscriminately from open trucks. Firing continued for several minutes till the people ran away. About 100 Adivasis were killed, and among those who survived, many had serious injuries. Bodies continued to be recovered from almost one week from tanks, wells, streams, and bushes where they had been dumped. The police carried away the dead and the uh, wounded in trucks. Importantly, the bodies were not handed over to the families but were burnt in a mass cremation by police. This was uh, seriously against the Gon tradition. Gons uh, buried their dead. The Gons continued to be harassed and arrested for several months. Of course, harassment by police, uh, 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 revenue and jungle officials is a regular uh, phenomena in Adivasi society. Why I tell this detail is to show the brutality of the post-colonial state against the Adivasis. But this brutality is justified by giving a next tag, therefore anti-national. If we read the Indra Valley revolt closely, it brings Bhimus, Komaram Bhimus Jodengat insurgency in the district uh, uh, to memory, which was uh, based in 1940 against the Nizam government. The way the Andhra Pradesh government handled the incident was not very different from the Nizam government's uh, handling of the Jordan Gut insurgency. In many sense, it was a continuation of an established pattern of government response to bond resistance. Although the land question was a prominent in the Indra Valley resistance, it was the Bhimu's spirit of self-rule that provided it with ideological inspiration. Following the Indra Valley massacre, the Gond youth formed a Gondwana Sangarshana Samiti to educate Adivasis on all kinds of forest taxes, which were uh, uh, which uh, were collected by the forest uh, uh, Javans, even though they were now banned long back. The Samiti campaigned against these taxes and asked Adivasis not to pay them. Also, the Samiti took up the issue of Adivasis self-rule in the villages. They revived their old Rai Sabhas, village councils, which were founded on the philosophy of a participatory democracy that ensures the participation of every member in the deliberation of the council. These Sabhas still existed in few places but were confined to cultural and religious matters only. 
the sabha now accepted their last political power and began acting as village councils discharging all duties at the village level the council took all the decisions of the village in a sense the gond began running a parallel government in the villages this was not tolerated by the government as well as uh, by the maoist groups as the adivasis uh, uh, began acting autonomously on their own the indian maoists indeed used adivasi areas as their gorilla zone uh, uh, but but failed to make adivasi question central to uh, their you know, proposed class struggle although the government uh, attempted to suppress this uh, development the practice uh, became prevalent in the fifth schedule areas where there was uh, no village council uh, you know, uh, uh, as in the you know, sixth schedule you know, areas a similar uh, movement for self rule called patalgadi was also witnessed in kunti gumla sing uh, uh, simdiga and uh, west singbum districts of jharkhand in 2017 patalgadi is a huge stone uh, plateau measuring 15 feet by 4 feet traditionally erected marking the death of a person in the adivasi community patalgadi has now got a new language and color in the jharkhand Uh, adivasi you kind know, of struggle it is erected at the uh, village entrance and painted with green color and uh, messages are you know, inscribed on them these messages uh, include excerpts from pesa act and uh, warning to the non adivasis banning them from entering the village the patalgadi demarcates the territories of the adivasi village this tradition was in fact revived by bd sharma a civil servant and uh, commissioner of the national st commission and bandi oran an ips officer in the late 1990s to propagate pesa act provisions among the you know adivasis the patalgadi movement started in kunti uh, the birthplace of birsa munda and uh, spread to a large area the movement was indeed a response to the jharkhand bjp government's attempt to amend the chota nagpur tenancy act of 1908 which was uh, promulgated in response to birsa munda's revolt and the uh, santal paragana tenancy act of 1949 these acts prohibits land transfer from adivasis to non adivasis bjp government wants to amend these acts and parcel the land to private corporates this move was opposed even by the opposition parties like jmm and no congress as there was massive resistance from the adivasis against the amendment the government had to withdraw it however the patalgadi movement got momentum and spread to new areas of the jharkhand chatisgarh and orissa in fact the movement against the amendment of the tenancy acts revolutionized and popularized the patalgadi movement in the region in many cases the adivasis did not allow the non adivasis including the government officials and police into their you know, villages in some places adivasis stopped participating in independence day and uh, republic day celebration stopped participating in elections stopped going to government schools and stopped recognizing central and state government and their acts most of the programs added uh, uh, sorry most of the programs adapted uh, and implemented by the adivasis in the patalgadi movement are enshrined in pesa act as well as in the forest rights acts of 2006 these acts ensures the protection of the adivasi village resources adivasi culture and traditions and more importantly the self rule of the you know, adivasis in the village the irony is that 
the adivas uh, the activist and the leaders of the patalgadi movement are branded as naxalites and anti national and many of them were booked by police under the sedition act uh, <clears throat> to sum up uh, it is clear from our uh, discussion you know, that the adivasis uh, witnessed double colonialism from the advent of the british rule in india although british colonialism had physically ended many of uh, many of its uh, apparatus are still in operation in the post colonial period as has uh, been you know delineated in most uh, recent studies the adivasis had rightly identified the british colonialists and indian settler colonists as their enemies from the you know, beginning and waged war against them the adivasis anti uh, colonial movements are now celebrated as a markers of nationalism if the adivasi anti british colonial movements are national then the post colonial adivasi movements are also national in their own right the anti colonial movement in general refers to nationalism and for adivasis nationalism means freedom in forests and hills and self determinism and self rule in their village in this sense all the adivasi resistances of colonial and post colonial are national in their own right so i think i'll stop here and uh, welcome anoka you know, your re responses and i thank you all uh, once again uh, for patiently listening to me thank you um, thank you bhandia for this uh, very interesting uh, and very succinct um, uh addressing of the adivasi issues in india today and uh, bhamya has actually in the talk raised certain very very important issues so before i just uh, open the floor for questions i'll just make a few observations uh because i've also been asked to comment on the be uh, a commentator uh, to the paper now uh, bhamya en uh, ends his talk by raising this very uh, important question about uh um you know uh, uh that how we need to you know he encourages us to um look into once again uh, into the social categories and the terminologies that we use today so look into the questions of nation look into the question of national so it takes us back to this old question that what constitutes a nation and the national can there be a single national project or are there multiple ways and multiple representations in the way the nation is claimed uh, by different groups of people and so you know this this important issue that how do different categories of citizens uh, claim their rights within the uh, polity now another uh, bhangya begins uh, his uh, talk by talk uh, uh, presentation by talking about adivasi uh, resistance uh, and uh, the question that i would uh, you know uh, like to really think about is um, what is specifically adivasi uh, about uh these forms of uh resistance can, can be uh, as he pointed out uh ronajit guho in uh, uh elementary aspects ronajit guho takes away this distinction between peasant and tribal movements but we can see that ks singh one of the earliest uh, to have studied adivasi societies and you know ks singh kind of brought his um you know together his role as a, a, a ias officer the administrator and as a scholar and he uh, clearly demarcates uh, or differentiates between uh present present the resistance and uh, peasants and adivasi society uh, whereas you know when we look at the societies there has been many social uh, sociologists and debate for example um uh, who argue that there is really not much uh, when we go by the characteristics of the society there is not much difference between uh, adivasis or peasants but i just want to think about another question this is the question of resistance why is it that adivasi resistance today 
and in colonial India and also in post-colonial India, why is it that it is always uh, uh, gives rise to um, uh, re uh, very violent repression on part of the state authorities. And I would like to also propose here that this, this lies, you know, this adivasiness, this idea of the adivasi as essentially somebody violent or um, uh, a savage the, that Bangya was talking about, the violent savage who has to be uh, subjugated or the noble savage who needs to be protected. Okay, so these are the ideas which have continued to inform. These are ideas which uh, developed in colonial India and they continue to inform in the way the state in post-colonial India looks at Adivasis. And so what we have is really, when we are talking about the state, you know, Adivasi resistance, why there has to be this brutality? Uh, why has a movement got to be put down with this brutality? It is, you know, um, the difference also lies uh, in the way the state regards them or the state deals with them. So the state has different mechanisms for dealing with tribal Adivasi movements and with peasant movements. Now, and, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, and again, some of these ideas, uh, when we are talking, uh, that he's uh, po uh, pointed out about uh, Patsalgari movement, for example, and uh, the idea of the Gram Sabha, but this is the basic, the grassroots democracy, you know, that any democratic institution or democratic societies uh, in different parts of the world, this is the way it would function, that it is at the basic level at the village level, the primary identity uh, that uh, you have um, uh, democracy uh, take participation and functioning. So this again brings us to this question then why Bakalgari, which was actually demanding the rights which were assured to them by the PESA Act, why was this then deemed to be seditious in whose, whose why should this the question of Adivasis being seditious arise when citizens were claiming their rights as citizens, rights which were guaranteed to them. And uh, another point I would like to talk about is also the idea of resistance. When we are talking about Adivasi movements, again, this it arises from this basic epistemic, uh, epistemic understanding of the Adivasi as innately somebody who is savage or violent or somebody who is wild. And so when we think of Adivasi movements or the state thinks of Adivasi movements, it is always thought of in terms of violence. These are violent upsurges, but that is not always the case. Um, from, from the 19th century onwards, there have been Adivasi movements which have been conducted using the modern mechanisms, the um, um, modes of resistance, leg legalistic, uh, Bangya was talking about the legalistic state, but uh, even the Adivasis throughout the 19th century, if we look at say uh, the question of land rights, so among the Mundas, among the Santals, among the Ho, among the Todas in the Nilgiris, there was a continuous negotiation with the state on questions of land rights and these negotiations were being fought out in the settlement courts at the district levels. And these are not individual you know, uh, attempts to claim their land rights. These were community movements because the entire community, almost entire villages were claiming and were trying to prove their uh, rights over land and using the same mechanisms that the state considered to be um, the uh, legal uh, issues. So we, we also have these non-violent resistance, you know, the resist, but these are never talked about when we talk about um, Adivasi resistance. We also have modern politics from the 1920s uh, uh, and 30s in Chotanagpur with the formation of Chotanagpur, uh, Unnati Samaj, etc. So you have interest groups coming together, forming these societies, which then, you know, developed into a political bloc. And then you find the participation, for example, in the long-drawn um, constituent assembly 
Italy, where the question of uh, how are Adivasi is going to be integrated with, uh, within the Indian state and Jaipal Singh's uh, debate in the Constituent Assembly, where Jaipal Singh categorically tells Nehru that don't come preaching mm -hmm. uh, uh, democracy to us. We know what democracy is. But, you know, so this is what we are bringing to the table, but what are we going to get in return? And that was something that was always denied to them. So the point I'm trying to make is that when we are talking about resistance, resistance and Adivasi resistance is always violent. And that is the um, popular imagination. That is the larger imagination, but that is not the case. Adivasis have various forms of resistance, and violence is only just one, of, one, one among them, as do every other uh, groups uh, and communities all across the country. So um, thank you once again, Bhangya. I don't know whether you would like to respond to some of these issues that uh, I drew up. This was a very, very interesting lecture indeed. Uh, so maybe you would like to respond, and then I'll uh, bring out the questions. I see there are a number of questions have come up already. Yeah, thank you, Ganuva Sanjay. Uh, I mean, it's a, a very uh, script uh, slick. Uh, you actually summed up the whole thing. Um, so we can take up the uh, questions one by one. Would you like to read it for me? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, there is the first uh, question is by D. Sionmani. And he's saying the FRA Act, uh, for what purpose uh, was it introduced, I suppose? Yes. Yeah, this uh, is uh, yeah, the Forest Rights Act uh, to actually uh, ensure you know, the, um, uh, the rights to Adivasis uh, over forest uh, you know, resources. Uh, I mean, it's a, uh, I mean, it's a, on paper, uh, the uh, act uh, has uh, many things actually. But uh, it did not uh, see you know, any implementation. I think uh, um, some 83 million acres of land supposed to be you know, uh, distributed to Adivasis. But uh, so far, I mean, uh, uh, I think even not 3% of the proposed area has not been you know, distributed to you know, Adivasis. Yeah, I mean, so the source, the you know, pathetic. Uh, uh, attitude of the Ganoka state towards the Ganoka Adivasis. Yes, uh, that Alok Mishra has asked, how do you locate the Adivasi consciousness in the case of the Jharkhand movement in nation building process? See, uh, as uh, Sanjita also mentioned, um, I look at uh, nation and nationalism from a different uh, standpoint, uh, particularly from Adivasi you know, point of view. You know, uh, uh, I strongly believe that you know, uh, India is a confederation of nations. There are many nations. Okay, so uh, it need not to be you know, one you know, nationalism or whatever it is. So each community have a different experience, historical experience, and articulated nationalism if you call it nationalism in modern Naka sense in different ways. So nationalism varies from uh, community to community in India. So for Adivasis, uh, what is nationalism? I mean, nationalism uh, in some sense uh, uh, referred to you know, anti-colonial movement, okay? So uh, if you think you know, in that sense, for Adivasis, nationalism means freedom in forest, uh, self-determinism, uh, self-rule you know, in their village, so that is a nationalist. As long as it is not each, you know, achieved, you know, they will you know, fight you know, against these uh, colonists. And as I said in my talk, uh, it is not only the British colonists who made the Adivasi life you now miserable, it is also the you know, local you know, colonists, Indian colonists. So, yeah, they have been fighting and the fight would, would, would you know, go on. Okay. Uh, uh, Bholeshwar Nayak has two questions. And one is this, um, had there been, 
Okay, yeah, so it's a to... comment. Had there been <laughs> Adivasi Ambedkar or Gandhi addressing okay. Adivasi there, there issues? Was, yeah, there was there a was. Adivasi Ambedkar, Jaipal Singh Munda, but uh, many of us you know, don't know about him. Jaipal Singh Munda was a really you know, a very articulative Adivasi you know, leader. Uh, he was uh, you know, a member of Constituent Assembly. He was an MP. He had you know, a wonderful discussion with Nehru inside the constituency uh, assembly and also outside the you know, assembly. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, his suggestions, his uh, ideas were not taken into consideration in any form. He was actually arguing for Adivasi you know, republics. I mean, so each Adivasi you know, area can be carved out as a you know, republic. Uh, then actually you know, had uh, you know, this suggestion you know, uh, taken you know, seriously, uh, today most of the Adivasi issues would have been you know, solved. Um, the next, um, uh, Bolisha Nayak has another question uh, about uh, some scholars consider Adivasis as backward Hindus. He's talking about G.S. Gurie. So how can that issue be dealt with since some Adivasi communities have been deeply accultured into Hinduism. See, this is uh, another very serious uh, problem. Uh, I mean, uh, Hinduism uh, was not uh, ever a kind of a religion. No, uh, I mean, uh, it's a geographical expression, but uh, uh, no, because of no colonial senses and you no know, social reform movement and uh, whatever it is, it uh, got a currency of you no know, religion. So uh, it, it, it is made a you know, uh, kind of you know, institutional religion during the uh, 19th century. And uh, irrespective of their uh, you know, response, I mean, so all the Adivasis, I mean, so are, let, it, let us put it in this way, um, non-Christians and non-Muslims, okay? And uh, 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 enumerated as you know, Hindu without their any kind of a concern. So, uh, but uh, Adivasis continue to you know, practice their own way of life. And now there is uh, uh, this uh, you know, Savarna movement uh, uh, among the you know, uh, you know, Jharkhandi um, uh, Adivasis and also other parts of you know, uh, India as well. So I think there is now you know, a reassertion of their culture you know, by the Adivasis. Uh, I'll take two questions here together. There is Chote Lal and also Dr. Michael uh, Haukip. I think, uh, you know, in some ways um, they are addressing the same question. And um, Chote Lal has said that Adivasi, uh, study of Adivasi communities often generalize Adivasis as a homogeneous group despite differences. And he wants to talk about the intergenerational difference he's asking about that so you know regarding uh, their uh, aspirations and um, dr michael uh, haukip has brought it again very important issue about um, a danger of, uh, of kind of homogenizing tribal or scheduled tribe uh, population because in the northeast they are more comfortable with calling themselves tribals rather than uh, adivasis so would you like to comment on this yeah, uh, this Adivasi uh, and you know, not this uh, you know, trial, uh, there is uh, you know, a tension uh, because of this tea tribe issue uh, uh, in some sense. And um, of course, uh, this uh, term is a Hindi uh, word and you know, largely you know, popular in you know, food schedule you know, areas. I'm aware of that. Uh, I'm using this uh, in a political uh, sense. Uh, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, there are uh, problems uh, when we uh, try to bring all the communities uh, again under one umbrella or try to homogenize it. Um, there are you know, uh, diversities and you know, disparities within the communities. Uh, I'm also aware of that. but. Uh, 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 ultimately, I mean, so we have to you know, uh, uh, bring all these uh, communities uh, you know, under one umbrella uh, and you, know, uh, you have to plug them you know, politically. So in that sense, uh, uh, this terminology is very, very you know, useful. 
Um, Divya has a question where she's uh, basically uh, talking about this uh, colonial, post-colonial assertions. And, you know, she's uh, talking about a continuity in both the uh, periods. But I think that was what uh, Angia has been talking about because he's talking about a continuity as well. So the Adivasis have marked their resistance against imperialism and inclusion of the state and corporate forces. And so her question is that, do we then say that the state corporate nexus has captured the consciousness of the Adivasis to advance their vested interests? Okay, so how do we explain this, Professor? Uh, yeah, this uh, you know, uh, uh, multinational companies, corporates are very much a part of the you know, state. The very uh, nature of a political economy has changed you know, in a recent year. We all have, you know, uh, have been you know, seeing this. So, uh, uh, of course, they are very much uh, part of this. And, you know, uh, I mean, so, uh, in all the you know, you know, state you know, policies, it is very much reflecting, I mean, so protecting the interest of the you know, uh, 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 corporates and you know, uh, Nadiwasis. And uh, I also mentioned you know, uh, uh, about the, you know, uh, you know introducing you know, PESA acts. Uh, uh, before that, uh, there was actually you know, a Supreme Court uh, judgment, uh, you know, Samatha uh, you know, uh, judgment, uh, under which even uh, government also no, uh, government, uh, central or state government uh, also cannot actually set up their no, shops in no, uh, uh, scheduled no, areas. But now, I mean, so under PESA, if the uh, village Sabha, I mean, so approves it, uh, anyone can no, buy no, land uh, in the no, uh, Adivasi no, areas. And managing Adivasi area, I mean, so, uh, Sabhas now become very easy because uh, there are also uh, uh, you know, considerable you know, percentage of non adivasis uh, you know, in these you know, areas. So uh, uh, there is a collaboration now. I mean, uh, 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 you know, government and you know, uh, the private uh, uh, you know, uh, companies and you know, uh, corporates uh, to actually you know, uh, occupy you know, these uh, adivasi areas. We all know. Now, uh, no, uh, 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 most of the you know, uh, um, minerals are actually you know, lying in Adivasi areas. So that is why state and you know, corporates are you now eyeing on Adivasi areas. Why they want uh, these areas is because there are you know, mining in that area. So, so uh, to uh, uh, no, uh, capture this mining, uh, they first want to boost the Adivasis uh, from these areas on various names. I mean, so, uh, they comes in different different you know, ways. You don't even realize you know, how they are com uh, coming. Okay, so yeah, that's it. Uh, Dr. Venkatesh Vaditya, uh, he has been asking, what is the role of governors in Adivasi autonomy development? Do you think they are able to perform that role effectively? <laughs> Yeah, okay. see, uh, uh, constitutionally, uh, governors are you know, custodians of this you know, schedule you know, areas, but uh, unfortunately, they are you know, miserably you know, failed in you know, protecting the uh, interest of the you know, Adivasis. So uh, there is also this Adivasi Advisory Council at uh, all you know, uh, states, uh, in all states, but uh, these councils, uh, means again headed by governor and this council meets only when they have to take a decision against the Kanoka Adivasi's interest. Yeah. Uh, William Crawley, is the term Janjati still in current use as an alternative to what used to be called tribals or does the term Adivasi cover different categories of indigenous people? Uh, there used to be a Janjati museum in Raipur, but um, it has been, it seems, run down and poorly patronized today. Yeah, I mean, so there are uh, certain local words, like uh, in Telugu areas, there is a word called Girijana Jatis, uh, Janjatis in Hindi areas. They are again uh, used by, you know, 
non-adivasis. I mean, it's used by the non-adivasis to address the Kanoka adivasis. Uh, I choose to you know, use Adivasi term because of you know, political reasons I told you. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Um, okay, Chote Lal has another question. And this is in recent studies have shown that Adivasis are active participants in the state. So how do we interpret Adivasi movements, whether through the framework of anti-state framework or within the framework of the state? Uh, see, um, modern state uh, has entered uh, into even our uh, bedrooms as uh, Foucault says. <laughs> so it is a uh, very difficult to actually you know, escape from the you know, uh, modern state. But uh, what uh, I'm actually arguing for is uh, within the uh, federal, you know, Indian federal system, uh, if at all it is there, we can uh, still accommodate you know, Adivasi you know, political questions. Um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there is no wrong in forming uh, Adivasi you know, uh, 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 republics uh, in the you know, uh, Adivasi you know, uh, areas, you know, giving some you know, uh, political autonomy to the you know, uh, Adivasis. You know, across, if you see the indigenous movement uh, you know, in Canada, in America, you know, in uh, Australia. I mean, so we take example for everything uh, you know, America. But uh, America has given uh, power, uh, you know, self-determinism and self-rule to their uh, First Nation people. Why don't you know, Indian government? Indian government is not even ready to uh, you know, agree you know, that there is a, existence of you no know, adivasis in india i mean indigenous people in india so i mean so, uh, no, the government, a state is not even you know, ready to accept existence of the you know uh, indigenous people in india this is a very you know ironic thing so uh, 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 i mean so i'm not uh, you know, anti you know, statist but within the you know, federal system we can now accommodate uh, Adivasi and our question. Ajay Kumar uh, from Vardha University. Why does the government want to connect the tribals with a new way of life in the replacement and resettlement? What is the purpose behind it? Uh, see, uh, uh, of course, uh, any modern state always uh, try to try to level the things and you know, create a kind of you know, homogeneity. I mean, so now we all have been seeing how things are going in India. Everything is one. Okay, so uh, uh, I mean, so, uh, the elites and dominates and you know, the state wants to make uh, everything you know, homogeneous. I mean, so, uh, because uh, uh, the uh, uh, I mean, so the uh, 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 diversities of the uh, communities, I don't know, uh, uh, the 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 uh, uh, what you call uh, different uh, uh, articulations and identities of the uh, communities are not seen as a threat to a uh, modern state. So that is why state always tried to you know uh, destroy these you uh, know uh, diversities and you know. Uh, make them, you know, kind of, you know, uh, a, a, a homogeneous uh, kind of, you know, uh, society. So, uh, yeah, this is all you know, happening, actually, part of this larger project. And the final question by Tikeshwar, can movies like RRR be seen as a reaction against Adivasi nationalism or Adivasi identity politics by the corporate and the state nexus? Yeah, I have also seen this uh, movie, RRR, and uh, I really felt very, very bad. I mean, uh, how these uh, cinema people actually commercializing the, you know, the names uh, of you know, these great you know, heroes. Uh, it is very unfortunate. I mean, uh, this uh, director and you know, actor should have at least uh, some shame, sensibility, you know, using you know, these great you know, heroes. So uh, there, there, I mean, so their names are used, and you know they 
created a, a new you know, story, new narrative of you know, whole thing. So uh, a person, like a ordinary people uh, might think that uh, that is the real story because uh, nobody knows uh, uh, what is the you know, uh, you know, history of uh, Sita Ramaraju or you know, uh, Komaram Bhim. So uh, you know, I take uh, really you know, serious uh, objection of this you know, movie. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Piyadesh need. Uh, yeah. I'm not uh, very sure about the time that we have. Uh, another 15 minutes. Um, yes. I just have one question and then we. Another 15, yeah. Banya, thank you so much for this lecture. Very insightful, bringing in so many questions to the table. Uh, I'm just um, wondering in terms of moments, conceptualization of moments, you know. Um, of course, our uh, agenda is not to argue for isolationism in terms of saying that uh, <coughs> Adivasi movements are exclusivist, right? I mean, um, but I wonder what is the response to the Chandravalli revolt? One thing from civil, uh, if I can use a broad category, civil society or other parallel movements, it can be gender or it can be caste or otherwise, you know, human rights, whatever. And uh, how, how do we uh, then conceptualize uh, about the <coughs> alliances that tribal movements have or can engender with other parallel movements? Because I don't want to assume that you know tribals are exclusivist in the sense that they have nothing to do with other communities. Uh, they are entirely apart from the uh, whole, right? Um, so the first thing is that how do the outside, how does the outsiders respond to this? Other movements, and um, what are the possibilities of alliances with other movements? Uh... Yeah, see, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, in India, you see um, very poor you know, support uh, from various other groups, uh, particularly uh, to Adivasi you know, cause. Uh, not only Adivasi, but various other social groups. I mean, so Dalit, as you're saying, you know, women. Every day, I mean, so there are so many incidents are you know, happening, but uh, nobody actually you know, respond you know, to this. Um, recently, we have seen you know, the Black Lives Matters. I mean, so this incident happened, and you know, and uh, you know, all uh, whites came out and you know, supported this you know, movement. Uh, except uh, some public intellectuals and you know, some activists. We don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, expect a kind of you no know, response from the you know, uh, uh, common citizens. Okay, we have seen in you know, uh, black life, uh, black life matters movement. I mean, so you see, you know, common ordinary people coming on street and you know, opposing you know, this racist you know, act. Have we ever seen any such incidents in Indian context? No, no, even. Uh, Martin Luther, Junior Martin Luther's movement was completely backed by whites. So my question is like in India, I mean, say every day, particularly in Adivasi you know, uh, areas, uh, um, girls are raped by the armed forces as well as by the outsiders every day, you know, every day. Uh, you don't believe there are many fatherless children in these areas. I mean, so whether it is Central India or Northeast India. And uh, nobody you know, bothers. I mean, so nobody uh, actually even care to uh, listen to them. Okay? That is the you know, irony. But uh, there is a possibility. I mean, so, uh, I mean, so uh, uh, now, particularly in the present uh, you know, regime, almost uh, all the communities are actually subjected to you know, violence in one form or you know, another form. If you see you know, from recent time, there is a group rapes on women. There is a group you know, attacks, you know, lynching of Muslims, Dalits, and you know, uh, Adivasis. So why is this trend is coming very you know, uh, apparently? One has to you know, think very seriously. So I means earlier there was a, 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 you know, attacks and you know, uh, atrocities, but it was a, 
more like you know uh, individual i mean uh, some individual uh, you know go, go, do some atrocities against another individual but now it is you know group uh, based kind of you no know, thing so there is a, some uh, you no know, kind of you no know, uh, you know, a larger trend actually i mean uh, uh, why they are doing this they because these groups are just coming in you know, a public life now okay so whether they want to uh, frighten them you know go keep them at their own places or uh, what is this i also don't understand i mean so uh, yeah but um to go to you know priyadarshini's question um uh, i think you know uh, this uh, support or the addressing of uh, adivasi violence this is really uh, sometimes limited to um Uh, groups uh, activist groups uh, yeah. which are concerned with civil liberties these often uh, come up uh, you know remain restricted to regions so uh, it is i agree to an uh, with um, pangya when he says that because uh, we don't see this at a national level it is only very rarely that we see a national projection yes i will say that there are projections and it's like indra gandhi is one of them um, goa at the same time the goa massacre but this is these are not individual these are state uh, sponsored in 1980s uh, and uh, uh, these are the that clash of Uh, the corporate interests and the clash of state interests into uh, the mining region and uh, what is being seen as um, uh, land interests, but there would be others where that national uh, interest has been focused. So you know we cannot, after all, forget Niamgiri, uh, and perhaps Niamgiri uh, breaks that um, model, as it were, because uh, Niamgiri or even the Narmada Bachao Andolan had uh, a national. focus and uh, perhaps um, uh, kind of generated a lot of interest at across the regions so you know it was not limited to a certain region and these uh, especially nyamgiri uh, 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 announcements have uh, the supreme court uh, judgments have been very important also for other uh, land acquisition uh, issues so uh, you know this is where um, of course and these would where you have to have the civil society some uh, groups coming together also with adivasi sometimes and uh, this cannot remain separate uh, i think that is what also what priyadarshini is talking about because if it has to be a, a broad base i mean adivasi problems cannot remain just simply adivasi problems these are our problems as indian citizens you know it is everybody's issue not just the issue of adivasis no uh, uh, at uh, national level uh, there is a particular you know, kind of narrative actually uh, run by you know the state like uh, uh, if uh, the you know rape is on you know, some um, like educated girl or you no know, bold girls they say that you no know, because uh, She is wearing short, no you know, clothes. She is, you know, uh, yeah, the, shaming the woman. Yeah, yeah. that is obvious. Like, yeah. So they 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 find some justification. If it is Adivasi, so they are so they are Nazlet, so they are anti-national. So they fit for this, you know, for treatment. Uh, if it is Muslims, so they are jihadis. So for Dalit, they are again anti-national. So I mean, so, uh, for each social group, they are giving a. You know, different different you know, tags, and uh, these tags actually gives them justification to suppress uh, these groups brutally. So when there is uh, some violence and crime and brutality against these groups, nobody you know, you know, talks you know, openly. They think that you know, I you know, you know, often you know, uh, 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 have conversation with you know, common people. and uh, you know, they say you know, they, you know, they fit for this i mean so we heard that uh, he is a you know, nazlet he is a jihadi so you know, they uh, really need such treatments so uh, i mean the state uh, you know, narrative is actually very effectively working on you know, masses i think so if there are no questions i think we can wind up sanjukta 
Yes, there is just another question by Sybil uh, KV. And he is asking, uh, Sybil is a she, I'm sorry, and the name is uh, a little confusing. So I'm probably getting it wrong. Um, uh, will you agree that the Adivasi question is in certain respects becoming political in a way that is non-statist? Do they always have to, do they have to always factor in the state to become political? Uh, so Sanjukta, uh, I think that will be the last question. We are running short of time. Okay. So, uh, my uh, broader uh, argument is that Adivasi uh, question is uh, basically you know, a political you know, question. And uh, state also should actually uh, openly come out, uh, come out and you know, uh, uh, do some political settlement with the you know, Adivasi you know, communities. Okay. Uh, then only we can solve the Adivasi question you know, permanently. When I say political, uh, it is you know, uh, uh, right over the you know, resources in their areas and you know, uh, uh, self-determinism and self-rule you know, in their you know, villages. Okay? So these are actually basically uh, 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 I mean, so, uh, associated with the you know, communities you know, collective rights. So state now is uh, ready to give you some welfare schemes, okay? But not the you know, collective rights of the you know, communities, collective rights of the communities over the forest resources or no uh, mining uh, or no various other you know, resources lying in their you know, areas. So, uh, 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 I mean, so arguing for a political you know, you know, right, need not be you know, anti you know, state. What Adivasis are arguing is very much uh, within the you know, uh, constitutional you know, framework. And uh, whatever they are asking, as I just mentioned in my you know, talk also, are very much uh, enshrined in PESA Act as well as the Forest Rights Act. They are not asking anything different, you know, which is not there in the you know, constitution. So uh, they are demanding for you know, uh, implementation of the you know, constitution in true sense. Okay, that is not you know, happening. So with the permission of chair, can I make the concluding remarks? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, especially after Zbangya's uh, uh, response uh, on uh, response of outsiders to violence against Adivas is um, terrifying. Uh, the apathy at that level is really terrifying. And uh, it, in that sense, um, the lecture raises um, questions, fundamental questions, both in terms of discipline of history as well as in terms of contemporary post-colonial movements. You know, um, so for me, I think what is very important and for all of us is a very important uh, point that marginalization of histories of Adivasis or any marginalized groups is not necessarily due to paucity of sources. It is not due to lack of sources. It is due to privileging of certain kinds of documentary evidence, narrowing down of the meaning of text and about ideological proclivities and political commitments. And these often go against the interests of the marginalized. Other important thing I got from the lecture is that histories of freedom cannot be exclusively recovered from the archive that while archive does constitute an important source, but for extracting a substantive idea of freedom, you have to shift the locus to experience, both historical experience and lived experience. And that can come from memories and meanings people make of the struggles for freedom, of their past struggles for freedom, and how in different ways historical legacies shape our perceptions and structure our present is very important. And the ways in which they impinge on freedom, on recognizing agency, as Bangya says, in terms of self-determinism and self-rule. And in this sense, as the lecture provides an insight, post-colonial struggles and aspirations in different forms, not only Adivasis, but even others, contribute to broadening and deepening democracy. They are not anti-democratic, they are neither anti-national. In the sense that they are continuation of anti-colonial struggles, contributing to the unfinished quest of freedom. That I think is a very important idea that we have to carry. 
and thus the task of the historian is to ever refine and replenish techniques of the historian's craft to create intellectual resources for such quests. So while celebration of anti-colonial national struggles, pride in cu national culture are positive acts of self-affirmation, but if such political cultural acts are produced by exclusivist denial of, of other forms of national struggles as unauthentic or not genuine or crushing other democratic struggles or insurgencies, that signifies a serious crisis in nationalist consciousness and politics. And so here comes the importance of cultivating the historical sense for me in that sense, you know, to allow for those images, those poignant images of sacrifice in struggles that everyday common people make, ordinary people make, as well as images of fear, insecurity, and uncertainty to affect our collective conscience. conscience. And there, thus there is a need to cultivate the historical sense. And perhaps the most important thing, and something which you know, uh, Bangya mentions as a closing remark of, uh, in his book, The Goals of Deccan, is resonates with what I think that um, is the fundamental problem is perhaps the unproblematic acceptance of the idea of national identity. What constitutes national identity? A sh what is na shared national and cultural consciousness, especially in relation to decolonization, right? A historian has an additional task to reflect on the ways of overcoming alienation. There are different forms of alienation or different communities. This will be partly accomplished that is doing away with alienation when Adivasi universe or many such universe which are marginalized are not merely subjects of inquiry or objects of inquiry, but when ideas, concepts, and their worldviews become part of the common historical discourse as reference for understanding the outside, shut off their particularity. They don't just become objects which are just then paracolized and say that these are just relevant to that context. In this sense, History writing is more than a recovery of the past. Neither is nation, when applied in a narrow sense, the sole referent of struggles for freedom. Else, there would be no genuine histories of the peripheries, be it in terms of gender, caste, or Adivasis. So thank you so much, Bhangya, for accepting to deliver a lecture to us. I think this is uh, both enlightening, but also uh, very frustrating to hear about the realities on the ground and the challenges as historians one is involved in trying to you know, grapple with these issues. And thank you, Sanjukta, for patiently bearing with us and uh, dealing with all the um, um, etiquette that involves uh, chairing the session. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jeshri and Sanjukta, uh, uh, for being you know, part of this whole discussion and, uh, and for the invitation, uh, Jeshri. Thank you. Sanjukta, you want to have the last word? Yeah, un unmute yourself. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, thank you. So um, uh, just to conclude, you know, I'm, I was also feeling um, that uh, this is a conversation that we've been having for the uh, last 20 years that most of us, you know, our generation, we have been doing our research. And in these 20 years, however, the terms of the question have not really changed much. Um, so let us see what the future has to hold. I mean, we have not seen any substantial uh, or significant change in this direction uh, <laughs> since the time when we started our research. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>